So uh, I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker. Uh, Colton Andrus is co-founder and CEO of Gremlin. Previously, he was a chaos engineer at Netflix, improving streaming reliability and operating edge services. He designed and built FIT, Netflix's failure injection service. And prior, he improved the performance and reliability of Amazon retail website. At both companies, he was served as a call leader, managing the resolution of company-wide incidents. So everybody give a big round of applause to Colton. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. I'll try not to walk right in front of the screen. Guess I'll pace over here. I'm a little bit of a pacer. Uh, appreciate it. Um, just before I forget, I've got a nice little gremlin plushie here. This is for the best outage story that someone comes and tells me today. I've got stickers for the runners up, but I always want to hear about how things went wrong and, and how you handled it. Uh, so I'll dive into things, maybe. Clicker, clicker. No, I won't dive into things. Get it all set up so it's ready to go. There we go. All right, so uh, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> a little bit of background about myself. I started my journey on building resilient or robust systems back at Amazon.com about 10 years ago. Uh, I was part of the team ensuring that the Amazon.com retail website didn't go down. And when it does go down, they lose tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue a minute. So it was well worth the time and investment. We did a lot of your classic operations type work. Uh, you know, we held postmortems or incident reviews. I was a call leader or an incident manager. You know, we did our Q4 prep and we did a lot of load testing and performance testing. But a lot of what we did was fundamentally reactive. And what we learned is to get past this threshold, to get past this plateau of availability, we needed to do something different. We needed to get in front of the problem and not just react when it occurred. So I had the opportunity at, or at Amazon to build a set of tools to help enable this behavior, uh, which is similar to what we built at Gremlin. After that, uh, while I was at Amazon, Netflix came out with this little tool called Chaos Monkey. Anyone heard of it? A couple people? Yeah, fairly popular. So I thought, oh, Netflix, this is a great place to learn and go deeper on this subject. And it was, and I went and joined the team there. I wasn't on the chaos team, I was on the edge platform team. So we owned the proxy and the API gateway. And if we didn't handle failure well, then you read about it on Twitter and read it. Uh, and it was a bad day for everybody involved. <clears throat> and there was a lot of opportunity, surprisingly, when I arrived to help build better tooling and better process. So what is chaos engineering? Raise your hand if you know the answer to this. One brave soul, two brave souls. No, I don't blame you. Like, what, what is chaos engineering? It, it mean, it's a little bit like DevOps. It's a little bit subjective. It can mean different things to different people. The way that I explain it when I go home for the holidays or I'm talking to my family is I use the vaccine analogy or the flu shot analogy. We're going to inject a little bit of harm in order to build an immunity, in order to find the weak points and strengthen them. Now, sometimes you get a little pushback on this idea or approach. I, I liken it to, you know, if we went back 200 years and we said, hey, I'm gonna inject you with this disease. Is that cool? You're gonna get some mixed results. You're probably gonna get a lot of, heck no, don't, no, we're not doing that. But this same concept applies here when it comes to chaos engineering. We're gonna inject a little bit of harm, but ultimately we're gonna become stronger, more robust or more resilient as a result of that. The other thing I'll, I'll talk about is how we do chaos engineering. I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth on this, but my definition for chaos engineering involves thoughtful planned experiments. So those of you who are familiar with Chaos Monkey might be saying, wait a minute, I thought the goal here was to randomly break things. And there's a time and a place to randomly break things, but I think that as a discipline, it's much more productive and healthy to think about it like an experiment. And I'll go into this a little bit more, but in essence, 
you know, what do we think is going to happen when we break the system? We don't want to just run out and start shooting servers and shutting stuff down and without a plan, without a, uh, an approach and a discipline to it. The other thing that's key about this approach, and I think that sets it apart from a lot of the operations work we do today, is it's something that we can do before things have gone wrong. A lot of what we focus on, how do we reduce mean time to engagement, how do we reduce mean time to detection or to resolution, focuses on once something bad has happened, how quickly can we fix it? Well, if we ever want to achieve truly high reliability numbers, if we want to be in the four nines or five nines world, then we get about an hour of downtime or less in a year. If it takes 10 minutes to get everyone on a call to figure out what's gone wrong, we're never going to achieve those kind of uptime numbers. And so being able to go out and prepare during the day after the coffee's kicked in uh, gets us, allows us to find and uncover these issues and prevent them much better. I know I need to do the wrapper, the wrapper mic style up by the mouth. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so the other thing I like to talk about is why, why has this become a problem? You know, chaos engineering or resilience testing, failure testing, it's not actually a new idea. It's an old idea. It's something that we were talking about in the 60s and the 70s when we were doing hardware failure testing. It's something that you can find written about in the 90s and the early 2000s. And so what has really changed that's, that's moved us to this world where it's become something that we have to have? Well, let's talk about how our systems have changed a little bit. The old world was a little bit more straightforward. We had some data centers, and we'd route traffic between them. You know, a lot of our redundancy lie at the data center level. And if things went wrong, we'd just rely on the other data center. And our applications were a bit more straightforward. You know, this is an oversimplification, but there was some front end here. There's some business logic that needs to happen. We'll let the database handle a lot of the tricky issues and propagation. We'll let OLTP do it. We wouldn't have to worry about it a whole lot. <clears throat> but these aren't the systems that we're building today. Uh, everybody wants to follow after Netflix and build systems that look like Netflix's. And they, in turn, kind of copied off of some of what Amazon and a lot of other early pioneers did, microservice distributed systems. Well, you get what you, uh, you, get what you sign up for here. This is, uh, this is what I like to call the microservice death ball. Uh, this is Amazon. This is circa 2012. So this doesn't involve AWS at all. This doesn't involve Kindle or digital. This is just the Amazon retail website, and it's way out of date. This is Netflix like uh, 2013, 2014. So again, a relatively simplified view of what their architecture looks like today. And as we look at all of these interconnected pieces, we look at all of the services that we've built where we've decided, hey, let's throw the network in between everything because you know the network is reliable. Asterisk, that was a joke. <laughs> um, what we have is, is this, uh, we have this complex system that is very difficult for any person to keep it in their head, for any team to keep it in their head, for a company to even understand. As we start talking about the things that can go wrong, the combinatorial explosion in here just makes it, uh, it, makes it unfathomable for us to go through and to brute force it or to randomly explore the whole thing. Um, a friend of mine, Peter Alvaro, professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz, talks about, you know, if we were to just throw darts at this like a dartboard, how long would it take us to fill the dartboard? Well, it would take us until the sun burnt out. That's how many combinations we would have to explore in a random or a brute force way to cover it all. So that just won't scale. It's just not an effective means of understanding and finding the problems within a system like this. The other thing that I think is super important to talk about is the cost of being wrong. Uh, as engineers, we often focus on how do we make our system the best that we can? How do we ensure that it's doing the right things? How do I not get paged at 2 in the morning when things break? But the business leaders don't think necessarily in the same terms as you and I. They care about the money that the system makes, that the business uh, cares about. They care about the time and the resources that ha they have available so that they can be allocated on ensuring the business survives and continues to provide value to its customers and its stakeholders. 
So we've had a fun year uh, for outages. Uh, I didn't include any that happened this week. Um, but a couple of examples. So Amazon.com on Prime Day was down for mm, a little while. Um, anyone have an idea how much that cost, what it was estimated to cost per minute? Let's throw out some numbers. See if anyone's, anyone's close. Five figures, six figures, seven figures. $200,000 a minute is what they estimated that outage cost. And it went on for an hour or two. So it was a millions and millions of, I think the number was $17 million is what they estimated. I don't care how much PR you get uh, for, for an outage like that. It's not offsetting that cost. Uh, Slack, I love Slack. We're a remote by default company. You know, a lot of our business happens in Slack. Unfortunately, Slack has had a rough year. There's been two or three pretty impactful outages. And you know it's a bad day when your team emails you, hey, is Slack down? <laughs> oh, I thought it was kind of quiet this morning. What's going on in here? Um, but, but there's also examples of things like when Delta Airlines has an outage. And, and it's, this, this really highlights the importance of technology on our society. When planes get grounded and people can't fly home, when, you know, if you're dealing with an urgent event or there's something very time sensitive and you're not able to make it where you need to go, there's a huge impact to our lives and what we're able to accomplish. And so at the end of the day, these outages cost a lot of money. They cost a lot of time as well. So first of all, when you talk to your bosses, when you talk to your leaders, you need to tell them, hey, when we go down, when things break, we lose money and our customers are unhappy. We have to make sure that that doesn't occur. Uh, the second impact is engineering time. And I think of this a little bit like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, whenever there's an outage, we think of the 10, 15, 20 minutes it takes to fix that outage. But really, everyone involved in that outage is going to spend the next two to three days digging into logs, digging into graphs, putting together the different root causes or the different contributing factors and understanding how the incident played out. Then we're going to have a post-mortem or an incident review. We're going to get a bunch of people in the room and we're going to talk for another hour or two about why it happened and how to prevent it from occurring. And then there's a bunch of action items that we need to go fix to ensure that the system doesn't slip into this state again. Now, that right there is a fair amount of engineering time. You think about engineering time as an expensive resource. We all get paid a good amount of money to build these systems and to make sure they work well. And so when outages occur, we're not building our features, we're not building our product, we're not focused on making our customers happy, we're, we're essentially paying down technical debt or we're cleaning up things or, or fixing things within the system. And sadly, a lot of those uh, action items that come out of those incident reviews may or may not actually be acted on or fixed. One of my pet peeves is we talk about all the things we need to fix to make it better and then they go off into Jira to die with the rest of our our catalog, and maybe we get to them at some point. Uh, personal note, that's where chaos engineering plays a big role. Take those action items and reproduce them for real. See that you fix them. Uh, don't have what Adrian Cockcroft calls availability theater. Um, that's one of my favorite terms. We were talking about it last night. Uh, we think we've made things better. We think we've fixed them, but we haven't actually tested them. So it's like we have that, we have that uh, database backup that we've never restored until things are broken and then we find out that database backup won't restore and we're out of luck. Or we, you know, we have different data centers and we have regional redundancy. Oh, but we've never actually failed out of a data center. We've never actually failed out of a region. So when things are going wrong and we need that, we need it to save us. Instead, it can cause more problems. It can cause a second failure mode or outage instead of saving us from the first one. So that's cool. How do we do this? I want to walk you through a little bit <clears throat> of some of my thoughts as, as they've matured this year on how we as organizations tend to approach this and what we tend to learn. So in the beginning, there was Chaos Monkey. This is your like level zero, in, in my humble opinion. It's a fine place to start if you don't have a lot of depth or sophistication. You know, you don't have to think too much about how you're going to explore the system. You're going to randomly break things. You're not thinking about all of the different failure modes. You're just going to start with one. And that's a fine place to begin. 
what you find is, you know, this isn't, this isn't going to net you the kind of return on your investment that you expect. It's great if you're moving to the cloud and you need to make sure you can handle hosts being rebooted. It's good if you want to test things like auto scaling and ensuring that the right behaviors happen there. But quickly, you're going to hit the limits of the value this provides. The next step is to start thinking about all of the things that can go wrong in our infrastructure, all of the host level failures. This can be things like, what happens when a service is CPU starved, or CPU bound? What happens if there's a memory leak? What happens if a disk fills up? Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been part of an outage because a disk filled up. Yeah, every company I've been at, every company I've been at, Amazon, Netflix, you name it, they've all had outages because a disk filled up. Seems like a relatively simple thing that we could test, and it is. It's not even that dangerous. We've just got to spend the time. Uh, what happens if there's clock skew? What happens if daylight savings happens or there's a leap second? What happens if our processes die? What happens if our containers and our hosts reboot? So to do this, we want to take a little bit more of a disciplined approach. This isn't let's just go randomly break things. This is let's run some experiments. Let's have a hypothesis. How do we think the system's going to behave? How are we going to measure that? How are we going to run this experiment in a way that's safe and scales? And to do that, we really need a degree of operational maturity. If we haven't yet got alerting, if we haven't yet got monitoring, if we're not to the point where we're able to understand how our system reacts to these failures, we're probably not ready to go break things. The flip side is, this is a great way to validate our operational maturity. When we go and we run an experiment, we want to see, does someone get paged? That's an important part of the process. When we go look at our dashboards, do they show us that a failure is happening, or does everything look sunshine and roses? And so, in fact, chaos engineering is one part technical, does our system do the right thing, but it's one part social. Do our, does our company do the right thing? Do we have an incident management process? Do people know how to get on the phone, or in Slack, or in a chat, wherever it is, to find out what's going on? Does our engagement work? I've, <laughs> As sad as it is, I've been part of many outages where somebody just didn't get paged. And then 20 minutes later, somebody called them. And there was an outage that maybe could have taken 10 minutes that took a half an hour or 45 minutes. It's worth the time and investment to validate these things. One of my favorite jokes is uh, the operational training I've received at basically every company. It amounts to, here's your pager. Good luck. Uh, maybe there's a run book over here. Maybe it's up to date. Figure it out. You're smart. You can figure it out. Imagine instead a world where your first week on call, your team came to you and said, hey, you know what? You're going to get paged this week. It's OK. It's going to be a mock exercise. We've got a safety net. We know what's wrong. But we want you to treat it like a real failure. We want you to get engaged. We want you to look at the dashboards and the run books. We want you to diagnose the problem. But hey, if you have questions, ask. This is a great time for that. When you're on a, a 2 a.m. you know, Sev Zero call and you've got VPs on and everyone's very urgently focused on fixing the problem, it's not a great time to raise your hand and say, hey, I've actually never run TCP dump. How does this work? It's not a great time to be like, I don't know what my service is doing here. So you'd rather do that during the day. You want that time to practice. And actually, I'd say chaos engineering is a practice, just like DevOps. Uh, I love the you will never be done bit. <laughs> I've never thought of it that way. Continuous improvement. But chaos engineering is a practice. It's something that we do regularly. It's like going to the gym. We want to ensure that we're getting the benefits. And so to do that, we have to invest that time and effort. So I want to give an example, uh, as I mentioned, monitoring of what a successful chaos engineering experiment looks like. So this is taken from Netflix. Uh, this black line across the top, that's can people stream. That's the metric that matters in Netflix, the metric. If that's impacted, it's a bad day for everybody involved. The green is normal system behavior, and the red is failure being injected. And so what we see here in this experiment is at around 11.40, they kick it off. And there's a little bit of retries and, and stacking here. But in essence, we're going to run this experiment, and we're going to start small. We're going to fail a, a subset of the traffic. Now, does that impact people's ability to stream? No. OK. That's what we want. Now we're going to ramp it up. We're going to increase the blast radius for this failure. 
So we're going to go from you know, 25% to 50% to 75% to close to 100%. From that, what we see is that this service, this is a, a circuit breaker, this is a function in essence, that this service can fail and no customer will know. And that's what we want here. What we want is the ability for a system to gracefully degrade wherever possible. Now this is about selecting a CDN and being able to, for people to find the content that they want. But the key here is that if this goes down for a, a short period of time or a temporary period, it's fine. This is where a SEV1 that everyone has to be paged in the middle of the night or on the weekend can be turned into a SEV2. Let's worry about this Monday morning. It's important, but we don't have to get everyone together on the weekend. Okay, so then we continue our, our maturity. We continue evolving. Now we need to start thinking about we can kind of handle the things that happen to us. What happens when bad things happen to the things that we rely on? And I think this is really key for the kind of distributed systems we're building today. We have a lot of SaaSes, we have a lot of external, we have a lot of internal and external dependencies. What happens when those fail? And do we handle it well? For this, we really have to understand the network level a bit more. It requires some sophistication. And so for this, what we advocate is more of a game day approach. Uh, game day is, is a term coined by Jesse Robbins uh, back at Amazon in the early 2000s. But in essence, he used to go shut down, core, uh, shut down racks, pull cables, break things, and see how the system and the company would handle it. This approach is, let's get a bunch of people in the room. Let's think about what could go wrong. Let's talk about it. Let's plan out some experiments. Let's talk about what we think will be happen and how we're going to measure it. And a key concept in this is the blast radius. I mentioned this earlier, but the key to the blast radius is we want to run the smallest experiment that will teach us something. Now, the point of all of this chaos engineering and failure experiments is to never impact customers. And while that seems counterintuitive, there are ways that we can mitigate that risk. One of them is you know, how we run the experiment. So can I test this failure mode on a single user? or a single request? Can I test this failure mode on a single container or a single host? I'm going to start in dev or staging to build confidence. I have to run in production at the end of the day. Production is a system that makes money where customers live, where scale matters. But to get to that point, we're going to start small. And at each step, we're going to essentially run the experiment. We're going to measure the outcome. Did it do what we expected? Did it gracefully degrade? Did it handle in a more robust way? If it did, then we're going to scale it up. Now we'll run it for three containers. Now we'll run it for a region or a zone. Now we'll run it for two services or three services. And at each step, we can scale it up. Now if at any point things go wrong, great, we're done. That's what we're here for. We found a bug. We found something in our system that didn't behave the way we expected. We can stop the experiment, we can take it offline, we can dig into the logs, and we can go find and fix what didn't work well. And we're testing different things at different levels of scale. At the small scale, do I handle exceptions? Do I handle nulls? Do I have a good fallback? At the large scale, it's do I protect myself from an increase of traffic? Do I back off of downstream services like a good citizen? Have I tuned my timeouts correctly? Uh, another. I guess pet peeve of mine is so often we, tune, we, we look at how a graph behaves and we draw a line for a timeout and we say, this should be good enough. But really, those timeouts are built for when everything's going wrong, not when everything's going well. And so if we haven't actually seen that they protect us when things are going wrong, they may not actually protect us when the real failure occurs. And then as we continue maturing, we can move up into the application level. So a lot of this has been infrastructure. You know, what happens when, when our hosts fail? What happens when Amazon or Google fails? But at the end of the day, that's a subset of the things that can go wrong. There are business failures and application failures that absolutely need to be handled well. And in fact, this is key to the customer experience. One of the things that was missing at Netflix when I arrived is this ability to understand what the user sees when you fail. And it doesn't have to be a large scale failure. Sometimes it's a small scale failure. Sometimes you time out while talking to the identity service, or you're unable to hit a cache and you have to fall back to some stale data. Does the UI handle that correctly? Or does it 
seg fault or does it throw an error? Does it show an ugly screen and an error code that no user knows what it means? And so wherever possible, we want to ensure that our systems gracefully degrade and that the user has the best experience possible. So with that, I'd like to invite people to come and join us in the community. What's cool about a new space, kind of like DevOps, is that we're in the early days of this chaos engineering practice. There's a few lessons we've learned along the way, and some of us have, have felt the pain a little earlier than the rest of the industry, but there's a lot of opportunity for growth and expansion here. And so one of the things I'm quite excited about is, you know, the people in this room, you may very well know the right solution. You may have a good answer. You may have a different approach that we haven't thought of. And we're all better when we can work together and collaborate. So one of the things I'm proud of is we have a public Slack. We started it this year, and we have over 2,000 engineers hanging out in there, sharing stories about outages, resilience, how they're building things, how they're monitoring things, how they're operating them. So if you're interested in this, if it sounds like fun, if it's something that you think you want to be involved in, come join the community. Come ask questions. Come teach us something new. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention. Come find me and uh, come find me and tell me a story. I'll give you a, a plushie or a sticker. Um, and since I have one moment, I'll give you my one minute pitch on Gremlin. Because sometimes people ask me, Colton, this is cool. What the hell does Gremlin do? Uh, so we're a tool that makes it easy to run these experiments. Something that makes it safe. Things like rollbacks and fail safes. Something that makes it secure. Uh, go tell your security team you want to break everything in prod and see what they tell you. They'll probably ask you if you've added some mechanisms to make sure that it's something you can audit, something that can be done well. And if you've used a developer tool in the last 10 years, you probably expect a good user interface, uh, a programmatic API, something that falls into your CI, CD pipeline. Well, that's exactly what we learned in our time at Amazon and Netflix, where we had the opportunity to build these platforms to run these chaos engineering experiments. And so what we've done is we've taken that, we've built uh, something that's better than what both Amazon and Netflix has, arguably. Third time around, you get to cheat a little bit. But we also care deeply about teaching people how to leverage this and how to get value out of it. And so while we're not a services company, my team spends a lot of time helping people understand how to do chaos engineering, how to do it safe and effective, and how to help people really get the value out of it. So if you'd like to learn more, if you have any questions, come find me. I'd love to tell you more. Thank you very much.